carrying on, you'll know. Uh, you know, I was thinking about that song too, the Savior more than life to me. And uh, it kind of goes along with what I'm going to talk about tonight. Pastor Elliot has been doing a lot of preaching and teaching lately about our need to have a walk with the Lord. And just like any good relationship, it depends on the amount of effort that we put into developing and maintaining our walk with the Lord as to the amount of success that we'll see from it. And uh, tonight we're going to look at the ministry of Philip and what an obedient servant of the Lord looks like, and more specifically, what the Lord can accomplish in our lives if we are willing to be used by Him and for His glory. Uh, so what does an obedient servant look like? Let's uh, open your Bibles to the book of Acts. And uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 8. And we'll start tonight in verse, uh, we'll start in verse 26. And the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem, unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Brother Tom Lynch, would you pray for the message tonight and for those that are out here who it might touch? Father, thank you for my word. Thank you for somebody to preach and I pray that you'll fill my brother and encourage him and guide his thoughts that uh, your word would come through and bring in the hearts of your people here and anyone that's lost it would touch their heart too. Have your way. We commit this service to you and ask for your help. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. This is one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. And uh, it's special to me because the Lord has shown me some things from it that helped to develop my walk with, with Him. Um, some things that have helped me to know that I can not only trust Him, but also taught me to learn to listen for His voice and know when He is calling for me to do something specific. And uh, that's important sometimes. You know, you, you get that... You, that nudge in there and you're just like, man, I know the Lord wants me to do this or he's calling some sort of thing. But the Lord has used this passage in other areas in my life too. This passage right here is the passage that I, the Lord first started dealing with me about the King James Bible being the Word of God. Come out of this uh, same Acts chapter 8. That's a whole nother message if I ever get invited back to do this again. <laughs> so, but, so, Verse 26 says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. The Bible tells us that Philip responded when he was called. Philip uh, obviously had a walk with the Lord. He was one of the first deacons. And uh, so let's look over, at, look over at verse 5 here in the same chapter, and we'll see just what Philip was called away from. And we'll look at verse 5, and it says that Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And uh, then we see that it says, and there was great joy in the city. So the Bible tells us that Philip had gone to the province of Samaria and had successfully preached the gospel of Christ to a nation of people that for the most part were hated by the Jews. Um, after Stephen uh, stoning and the Jews' rejection of the testimony that Stephen gave, the gospel started going out to the, to the other nations. And so, uh, but we find in, uh, you know, the Samaritans, they were a mixed race of people. Uh, they were placed in the cities of Samaria by the king of Assyria when he took the ten tribes of Israel into captivity. And uh, so the Jews didn't really care for him. But Philip went down and preached the gospel to him. and said he successfully preached the gospel to him. And it says in verse 8 that there was great joy in the city. Philip certainly was a spirit-filled servant that was willing to be used by God when the angel of the Lord spake unto him and gave him a charge. Verse 27 says... 
He arose and went. He was obedient. Notice the Bible doesn't say that he had to pray about it or think about it or consult about it, but that he simply rose and went. And, uh, you know, it may seem odd that, that God would move Philip from such a busy and fruitful ministry to Samaria. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe he was wore out from the thing or you need a, re, uh, a reset or refocus or the, who knows why. But uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Something that we would do well to heed even today. Amen. Trusting the Lord when things don't make sense is part of growing in your walk with the Lord. And through experiences like this, we can learn to trust him. How would you react if God called you out of a successful ministry to another work? Uh, you know, if God would call somebody out of here into a ministry, uh, whether it be evangelism or uh, some foreign mission field or what have you, or uh, to plant a church somewhere, I don't know. But uh, there's, this is a really good place. And I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful that the Lord has led me here. Amen. And uh, I can look back at all the places I've been, and as He's moved from me from place to place, it was like I grew and, and I learned more. And I'm telling you, the amount of Bible you can learn in this church right here is very great compared to some of the places I've gone. I'm not putting them down, but I'm just saying the amount of Bible knowledge is good here. But we, we can't get caught up on our, our love of knowledge. We've got to be willing to put, that, put feet to it if the Lord calls us to do something. Uh, 1 Samuel 15.22 says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings as sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken better than the fat of rams. As of yet, Philip had not even been told what to do when he got there, but the Bible says that he went. One of the first ministries after Heather and I got married and got involved in church was the Awana ministry. And I remember they come and ask me, they said, hey, <laughs> Steve, maybe not said it like that, but they said, would you be interested in helping out in Awana? Now, I didn't even know what Awana's was. But uh, I don't know. I was probably, I don't know how old I was, maybe 20. I don't know, 27, 28 years old, I'll say, something like that. And uh, they said, well, you'll, you won't have to be a leader or nothing, but you'll be an assistant. You would be assisting the guy that's in charge of third and fourth grade boys. I said, yeah, okay, I think I can do that. And uh, I said, so I went a few weeks and just sort of observed. And, uh, you know, it was, I thought, man, it's kind of a cool. It's all, I mean, I know we do Awanas here, so you guys know what it is. But, but uh, so anyways, I got involved in Awanas. And ironically, the leader of my group got called away to another ministry, so that, which moved me up the next year to be the leader. And ultimately, I ended up being the guy in charge of third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade boys. And it was a very good ministry. I liked it. I liked it a lot, actually. And uh, they put me to shame on Bible memorization. Kids can memorize stuff when they're small and way better than adults can do it when they're older. I'm sure everybody here knows that. So anyway, in 2004, in the fall, we had this big Awana harvest party plan. We had 100 bales of straw brought in. We built this hay maze, straw maze, sorry, Heather. And so everything was going. I was kind of in charge of this thing a little bit. Uh, I wasn't the commander, but it was kind of, you know, that was kind of our thing, setting this up. So that Wednesday morning, I'm sitting at work. I worked in the trolley shop at the time. And Gary Robinson, our supervisor, used to always have meetings with us on the bus. He'd hand out the work details for the day, what was going on. At the end of it, we had a little bit of a session where we'd shoot the breeze. Anybody got anything? And I remember this one time, same day, we was having our Awanas party. Uh, our union steward said, hey, I, uh, I talked to Wilbur Plymel's wife last night and uh, said, uh, said, oh, Vic, uh, Victor knows who I'm talking about. He worked with him, too. Said, oh, uh, Wilbur's sitting in a nursing home dying of throat cancer. His wife thought it'd be nice if some of the fellows would come by and visit him. Oh, that'd be nice, Lord, if you'd send somebody to visit him is what I started thinking. But, you know, all day the Lord, you know, I'm talking about that still small voice, you know what I'm talking about, started, 
And I was like, man, Lord, I got church tonight. I can't go. You know that. I mean, I got this Awana party. And I, was, and I wish I could tell you, I was like, all right, Lord, I'm ready. Send me. But I wasn't. So I struggled to obey all day. I talked to some Christian friends. I probably talked to Victor that day. I don't know. Uh, but I talked to some other guys I worked with at the time. And ultimately, I went. I knew God was calling me to do it. So I went. I called up Heather. I went into the break room, used the phone because you had to go outside and pull up an antenna on your cell phone back then for it to work. And I just went in and told her. I said, here's what's going on, honey. I said, there's a good chance I'm going to be late tonight. I said, can you just call and let them know? She said, okay, and pray. So verse 27 and verse 28. It says, and he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. What would you do if God sent you to talk to a lost man in need of salvation? Or someone that you thought could be a lost man in need of salvation? Here we see a lost man seeking salvation, and the Lord sending some man to lead him to Jesus Christ. I wonder where the unit got the copy of the scriptures that Isaiah, that the prophet, that copy of Isaiah, the prophet that he was reading. And uh, I did a little reading on this, and I don't, I'm not going to be real dogmatic on this, but turn over to Jeremiah 38. I just want to show you guys something. This, this is something kind of neat the Lord showed me a little bit. You guys might already know this, I don't know. But Jeremiah 38, chapter 7. Or verse 7, rather. Verse 7 of Jeremiah 38. And this is about Ebedmelech the Ethiopian and Jeremiah the prophet. It says, Now when Ebedmelech the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king then sitting in the gate of Benjamin, Ebedmelech went forth out of the king's house and spake to the king, saying, my lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon. And he is like to die from hunger in, this, in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebedmelech, or Ebedmelech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from hence thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he die. So Ebedmelech took the men with him, and he went into the house of the king under the treasury, took thence old cast clouts and old rotten rags and let them down by cords into the dungeon to Jeremiah. And he bade Melech the Ethiopian said unto Jeremiah, Put now these old cast clouts and rotten rags under thine armholes, under the cords. And Jeremiah did so. So they drew up Jeremiah the, uh, with cords and took him up out of the dungeon and Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Now, flip a couple pages over to chapter 39. <clears throat> and look at verse 15. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Go and speak to Ab Abimelech the Ethiopian, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for evil and not for good, and they shall be accomplished in that day before thee. But I will deliver thee in that day, saith the Lord, and thou shalt not be given unto, into the hand of the men whom thou art afraid. Amen. For I will surely deliver thee, thou shalt not fall by the sword, but thy life shall be for a prey unto them. Because thou hast put thy trust in me, saith the Lord. Amen. It's hard to say why the Ethiopian eunuch was even interested in the God of Israel. Perhaps he heard about Abimelech and Jeremiah from his ancestors, and it had been passed down through the generations. Perhaps the kindness that Abimelech had shown Jeremiah was noticed by God that the Lord had blessed his family lineage because of it. But Hebrews 11:6 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for that he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So who knows, but someone somewhere had given the Ethiopian some knowledge of God, had placed the right book in his hands, and he was searching for answers. Look over here, look at verse, uh, let's look at verse 29. Chapter 8, verse, back to Acts now. Back to Acts. 
And verse 29 says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Uh, then the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. And in his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. Philip is led by the Holy Spirit to this Ethiopian to guide him using the scripture that he was already reading. Uh, to believe in Jesus Christ as his Savior. Verse 29, the Holy Spirit has now given Philip some specific instructions before he just told him to arise and go. But once he got there, he got some instruction. And uh, verse 30 says that Philip runs thither to him, hears him re reading Isaiah the prophet, and asks him if he understands what he's reading. The Ethiopian's response is, How can I unless some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? God uses the foolishness of preaching. That's, that's God's method. That's his way. It's not the world that don't make sense to the world. But that's, nonetheless, it's God's way. Amen. Verse 32 and verse 33 is Philip takes time to witness to this lost man in need of salvation. You see how the Lord works this stuff out? So, back to my friend who was dying of throat cancer, Wilbur Plymo. Oh, Wilbur, he was, uh, he was an interesting character. He, uh, he was a Korean War air uh, gunner on a bomber. I don't know if that had been Air Force yet or if that was still Army Air Corps. I don't know. But, so, he was kind of a, he was, he was a tough old dude. He, uh, he, owned a little, he owned a little farm up around Tip City. I remember going up there uh, to get some parts off of him one time. He, I like Oldsmobiles. He was into Oldsmobiles, so we would swap parts. Uh, I actually work in the shop now that he worked in at, when I started there. And uh, old Wilbur had this old international combine, I remember. It was one of the only times I ever, but he, he's like, you want to get in that thing? I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he fires that thing up, man, when he turned that big old corn head. I mean, it, it should, I was like, wow. That was, so... That's a close, I don't know, I'll, being a farmer might be, I think I could do it. Probably, it's probably something you ought to be born into, but, but anyway, I had a good rapport with Wilbur. And uh, so as I left, I wondered, I knew he was a, he was a gruff man though, you know. I knew he w it wasn't going to be like, uh, I didn't know how it was going to be received. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like when you go street preaching, you don't, you know. People waving at you in different ways and all kinds of things kind of happened, but it was, I was new to it. So anyway, there was many roadblocks. Uh, I had to go and, one, I had to go look up the address to the place. We, you know, we didn't, well, at least I didn't have a smartphone back then, so I would look up, found out where the place was, and there was traffic. I got there about 5 o'clock, and, I mean, it was just a mess. Uh, I went into the room and, and the office there and I said hey you know I asked for Wilbur Plymouth and they gave me his room number I had my Bible with me and uh, I leaned in I found his room and it was it was full of people for one it was a double room but I, I looked in there and I seen Will and he's 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 sitting there dressed and uh, he said his hat Wilbur <laughs> Wilbur had a big old head you know you know them hat like you wear a ball cap and it's got them things on the back with all the snaps Wilbur would have been on the last one or two snaps on his hat. I mean, it's just, so he's sitting in his chair, and I, he sees me. And I say, hey, Will, what's going on? He said, Steve. I say, hey, Will. I said, hey, it looks like you're, you're full. Maybe I'll come back. And his wife's like, oh, no, 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 we're getting ready to leave. You come on in. And so I, I did, and, you know, small talk as they leave. And I go in and sit in this guy. He passed the first bed, and there's some guy laying there in a full cast thing with his arm up. And I don't know what happened to that guy, but it wasn't good. And uh, so Wilbur's sitting in his chair, and he's fully dressed. I didn't really know what to expect. You know, I thought there'd be tubes or something like that. 
I thought he would look in worse shape than he was. But um, so I go in, I sit down on his bed, and we're kind of small talking. You know, I'm thinking, he's asking about the shop, how things are, and I'm trying to think, how do I? And then this, all of a sudden this dietician comes in, and she's in there talking, wanting to know what he's wanting for, and he's on a feeding tube anyway, but so I was thinking, wonder what that's about. But So that took up some time. I'm starting to get back. You know, she leaves, and we start to get back. And then all of a sudden, the doctor comes in. And it was just all these things, one thing after us. I said, Will, want me to wait? No, you ain't got to wait out there. You can stay in here. And I heard a doctor say this. He goes, Wilbur, if you can swallow food, you can go home. But until we can get this feeding tube out, you got to stay here. we got to make sure that, because they'd done something to his throat. Like I said, he had throat cancer. So, okay. So the doctor leaves. You ain't going to believe this, but then the physical therapist shows up and says, Wilbur, it's time for your appointment. You got to, and I was like, man, you know, I'm thinking in my head, Lord, I have misunderstood you somehow. There's some reason that I'm not getting anywhere, but okay. So Wilbur says, hey, Steve, won't, won't you walk with me? They stuck him in this, uh, they stuck him in this chair. It wasn't like a regular wheelchair, but it was like a I remember when I was in, in elementary school, the teachers had these wooden chairs, and they had slats on them and stuff. Well, anyways, it was, a, it was a wheelchair. They had wheels on it. It was like that, like they just pushed them. So we, I walked down there, and then the lady's like, well, Wilbur, here's your room. And he's like, I said, hey, Will. I said, I'll come back and visit you again. And he said, yeah, okay, I'd like that. And he said, when you do, bring that book in your hand and read it to me. <laughs> I was like, whoa, the Lord had my attention now, you know. I was like, okay. So Wilbur goes off to his, they, they talk like it's going to be about 40 minutes. So, so I go out and I call Heather. Get my little flip phone out, pull the antenna up. Honey, you ain't going to believe this. And so I explained all the stuff that had happened. And uh, I said, you're going to have to call up here at the church and let them know I'm going to be late. The Lord has given me a charge. I got something to do here. I know what I need to do. And uh, so I said, pray. So I go out to my, you know, I'm sitting out there in my truck. Uh, I get my Bible out. I look over my verses. And I'm thinking about what I'm going to say. What, I might, what might he ask me, you know? Uh, I make a few recons back in there, look in his room, see if he's back yet. Well, about 45 minutes later, I see Will sitting in his chair again. And uh, so I drop in. And uh, I lean in. I said, hey, Will. He's like, Steve, you're still here. I said, yeah. I said, Will, I decided just to wait. I wanted to talk to you. And uh, here he was sitting there in front of his tray with this pile of pureed spaghetti on a plate. And he's just looking at it. And uh, he's all sad looking, you know. He says, Steve, I just want to go home. He said, I'm, I, if, if I die, I want to die. I don't want to be here. But they won't let me leave until I can eat that. And I was thinking, wow. So I walk over and I sit down on the edge of his bed and start with a little small talk again. But I noticed he, he was looking at my Bible. And so I just, I said, Will, how's your relationship with the Lord? He said, well, it could be better. It could be better. I said, uh, has there been a time in your life, Wilbur, when you asked Jesus Christ to save your soul? He says, well, he said, I remember when I was young, I was at the altar one time praying. Me and my dad went up in a, he said, I don't remember if it was a revival service or a church service of some sort. But he said, I can't tell you what I remember what we prayed about. He said, I don't, I don't really know. I said, Wilbur, can I show you from the Bible what it says you must do to be saved? And... Uh, Wilbur says, yeah. And I'm thinking, so far, all I've had to do was show up. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Spirit strengthening my walk with the Lord. The stuff the Lord shows you in the way. All the stuff that if you didn't do it, you would have missed. And uh, so anyway, back to, let's look at verse, uh, look over in verse 34. Here, let's, it says, The eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? 
And when Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he was baptized. The Ethiopian asked Philip who the prophet was talking about, himself or some other man. And Philip shows him here in verse 35 from the same scripture that it is speaking of Jesus Christ, and he begins to preach Jesus unto him is what it says. And verse 36 says, as they went, the Ethiopian wants to get baptized. Something's starting to change. Something's starting to, the Holy Spirit's really starting to impress some stuff on him. And uh, so the so the Spirit leads the right man to preach the right word, and the Holy Spirit opens his eyes to truth. And the Ethiopian eunuch says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Notice the order here. And then they both went down into the water, and Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Getting baptized don't save you. You've got to believe something, and then you get baptized as a result. As I was sitting there talking to Wilbur, with tears beginning to run down his face, I never, I'm telling you guys, I never, the Lord, it, I look forward to seeing Wilbur in heaven. I really do. Uh, he was sitting down there with tears run down his face as I read the Bible to him. I was using some of the same verses I used to lead my, my Wana kids. Uh, the Roman road, that's what we use. I read uh, Romans 3.23. I read Romans 6.23. You know what? Let's look at them. Amen. Turn over to Romans 3.23. This won't, this won't take too long. Romans 3.23. You got a real good Bible. That's page 1194. Amen. <clears throat> Sorry. So... Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I said, Wilbur, you see what that says? It says, all have sinned. We all got a sin problem. We're born with it. We can't, we can't get out of it. I said, you understand you're a sinner, Wilbur. He said, yeah, no, I understand that. So I said, I look over here at verse uh, 6.23. Romans 6.23 I said, look here, Wilbur. And I showed him right on my Bible. I had it in verses highlighted so he could see it. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I said, Will, you know what wages are. You worked, you retired. He said, yeah. I said, a wage is like your paycheck for what you did. It's what you, it's what you earned for what you did. And according to this Bible, it says, that we earn death because of our sin. And, and there is physical death, but this death is the second death. This is eternal separation from God. If you die in this death, you is done. And uh, I said, but look here. It says that uh, eternal life, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I said, so look, look back here at Romans 5, 8. Flip back one page. And here it says, but God commandeth his own love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So I said, Wilbur, we got this sin problem, and the sin problem is going to lead to death. But God offers a gift through his son, Jesus Christ, and it says here that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that sin debt has already been paid. So there's a way out. How do, how do we get this way out? So I told him I, I flipped over. Well, I, I flipped it so you can see it. Flip over to Romans 10. I know you all know most of these verses, but let's just look at them. The Bible says in verse 9 of Romans 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I said, Will, many people 
plan to get right during the 11th hour of their life. Everybody wants to live their life, and then right at the end, they want to get saved and slide into heaven. But I said many people plan to do that, end up dying at 1030. Yeah. And uh, Wilbur, I'm, I'm telling you, tears, he says, Steve, will this still work during the 11th hour? I said, it sure will, Wilbur. Look right here at verse 13. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. As long as you're breathing, you can do it. Amen. And so right then and there, I asked Wilbur, I said, you want to pray and ask Jesus to save your soul, Will? He said, yeah. He said, I sure do. He said, but Steve, he said, I need some help. He said, I don't, I'm, I don't know how to pray. I said, Wilbur, I'll tell you what. I said, I'll lead you. But I said, this has to be your desire. I said, these aren't magic words. This ain't like, I said, if, he said, no. He said, I want to get saved. And so we did. We bowed our head right there and said, Lord Jesus, we, uh, Wilbur here wants to get saved. He said, he's, I said, forgive me for my sin. And uh, I know you paid a sin debt for me. I know you died for me. He says, I confess you as my Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead, and I'm calling on you to save me, Lord. And uh, so then I prayed a little prayer after that to kind of just thanking the Lord for the opportunity. And uh, I'll tell you what, Wilbur got saved right there in that room that night, and all I had to do was show up. And the Lord had prepared me for the day just by working with kids, my wanna kids. And uh, so look at verse 39, back to Acts chapter 8. I'm almost done here, so. It says, And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Just as Philip and the eunuch parted ways, rejoicing, so did Wilbur and I. In fact, the lady that was sitting with the mummy guy as I was leaving, she said, young man, I just want you to know that blessed my heart hearing you lead that man to Christ. I was pretty bold at that point. I said, ma'am, I said, the same Jesus that just saved Wilbur's soul will save yours too. And she says, oh, honey, I'm already saved. She said, I was just silently praying for you. It just blessed my heart listening to you lead that man to Christ and hear him get saved. And, uh, man, I'll tell you what, I, I floated out of that room. Uh, I never saw Wilbur again after that, though. Uh, he passed away a, just a few short months later, but I look forward to seeing him in heaven soon. I think the Lord, I really think the Lord would have saved Wilbur's soul, maybe not that evening, but soon, whether I'd have went or not. But my point is, since... Pastors all the time talking about our walk. Look what I would have missed out on. Look what strength I would have missed on. And, and uh, I mean, you know, so the walk is certainly important. So what has God called you to do? For those of you who are saved and here tonight, how is your walk with the Lord? Do you even have one? Uh, do you pay attention to that still small voice when he nudges you, or is it, crowded out by self and the worldliness that's all around us. I mean, it's, it's a noisy world. Uh, can, you even, can, you, can you even discern it anymore outside of being in the church house? All Christians would do well to live their lives with the judgment seat of Christ in view because that is all where we're headed at some point. And uh, there's rewards and there's loss there. And when you, in view of eternity versus... 70, 80, maybe 90 years on this earth, is it really worth it to live this life for what you want and not lay up treasures in heaven? Now listen to me here. For those of you in here who are not saved, uh, Jesus said, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. You can miss heaven by 10 to 12 inches. And that's the difference between a head knowledge and a heart knowledge. You can know all about this book. You can know all about Jesus. You can know all about religion or anything else. But if you die without Jesus Christ in your heart, the Bible says you're going to end up in a place called hell. And you can't get out of that thing. 
Uh, it's no accident that you are here tonight. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, 6, Seek ye the Lord my, while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You heard a story from the Bible how a lost man was saved, and you heard a testimony, testimony from me how a lost co-worker was saved. How will your story end tonight, saved or lost? The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Pastor us. Amen. Amen. Amen.